we often see statistics about how many lions or giraffes are left in the wild. But where do those figures come from? Today, we'll hear about a comprehensive wildlife census conducted in Kenya. Find out why it was done and learn the results. Welcome to this new edition of Eco Africa, the Pan African and European Environmental Show. I am Sandra Twinobidium here in Kampala, Uganda. Hey, Chris, how are you doing today? Just fine, Sandra. It's good to be here again. And as always, we've put together a great program with interest and report on preserving nature and protecting the environment. Here is a brief look at what's in store. Giving old clothes a fresh look in Egypt. A startup in South Africa that supports wildlife conservation. And environmental protection as a school subject in Ghana. Count to conserve. That was the motto for Kenya's first official wildlife census in an extensive survey on animals that dwell in the country on land and in water. The aim was to collect data that would help conservationists preserve and also protect the wildlife better. And that means all wildlife, not just the handful of exotic creatures many tourists dream of seeing on safaris. <music> A pack of African wild dogs. It's a rare sighting. Wildlife conservationist Paula Kahumbu and her crew spotted the typically shy creatures in Laikipia, where conservation efforts have seen their numbers grow from 2 to 40. Wild dogs are under grave threat because they're very sensitive to diseases that are carried by domestic dogs. They are also um, targeted by communities because of human uh, wildlife conflict. So wild dogs sometimes attack livestock and the communities retaliate. Fewer than 1,000 of these endangered species remain in Kenya. Three years ago, Kahumbu launched a TV series to help such species. It draws attention to how communities and individuals can aid conservation efforts. The wildlife series that I produce, Wildlife Warriors, aims to excite people about nature, educate them, and inspire them to care and to act to save them. We want to see people going to the national parks, participating in cleanups, doing tree planting, uh, protesting when these wildlife are in trouble. And rhinos and wild dogs are not the only wildlife in trouble in Kenya. Certain species of giraffes are also endangered and a lot of animals are losing habitat through human activities and climate change. At the same time, wildlife tourism is an important source of income, accounting for about 7% of Kenya's GDP. Conservation efforts tend to focus on Kenya's iconic Big Five, lions, elephants, buffaloes, rhinos and leopards. But they alone don't hold the fragile ecosystems together. To get a better sense of the overall picture last year, the Kenyan government undertook the biggest wildlife census ever conducted in Africa. The effort collected data in over 50% of the country's landmass, which included national parks, reserves, and conservancies. We found um, uh, positive results particularly for species like elephants, we, there was a positive growth. We were able to grow our population from uh, 34,000 to 36,280. The rhino population is also doing very well. But in other front, some rare antelopes. We recorded very low numbers. This finding led to a recommendation to step up care for endangered ruminant species. But conservation is costly, and all too often donations are funneled to special projects like protecting the last two surviving northern white rhinos in Oipejeta, a private conservancy. The regions popular with tourists are also where the money tends to flow. A representative of one conservation organization believes this practice is short-sighted. So the parks are, that are not as frequently visited by uh, tourists 
are more very, very, very important for our ecosystem services. They absorb more carbon than any other fo forest area in the world. Although the main aim of the census was to collect data on animal populations, it also revealed information about their habitats and the need for more protected areas. It gives us a status of the health of our ecosystems and our biodiversity. Uh, in reality, we only really looked at mammals, large mammals in particular, but the truth is most of our biodiversity is in forests, it's in rivers, it's under the ground in the soil. Um, so those results will tell us something about the health of all of our ecosystems because all those animals eat the vegetation or drink the water. The Calabas Conservation in Diani on Kenya's southeast coast protects wildlife at the same time as supporting biodiversity. Here, they have managed to stabilize the Colobus population with relatively simple measures like installing monkey bridges. By connecting different parts of the forest, the primates can move freely while avoiding dangers posed by traffic. And the conservationists here have started a tree planting campaign. More trees will provide food and shelter while maintaining the soil's humidity. We teach people how important these indigenous trees are and tell them which of the trees that animals like colobus and other monkey species prefer. In the meantime, predator-free zones have also been introduced for some antelope species. Mountain bongos were also transferred from one conservancy to another from where they will slowly be reintroduced into the wild. An unexpected result of the census was discovering herds in areas that were previously unexplored. There were areas we have never censored before. We found significant numbers of giraffes that we've never known they are there. Also, there is a population of elephants that we counted between Kidepo in, in, Taz, in Uganda and Kenya, about 1821 elephants. If we did not cover the entire country, we never knew those elephants were there. The final report recommends publishing a national wildlife census every three years and also allocating more resources for monitoring and supporting rare and endemic species. Sounds like a good thing, especially if it helps people and the animals coexist more peacefully. In South Africa, our startup has also come up with a clever way of supporting the work of national parks. But their method relies on high tech. Now, what could that have to do with nature conservation, Chris? More than you might think, Sandra, this particular trio of entrepreneurs have started a crypto platform which enables users to trade unique animal cards and supports conservation at the same time. Let's take a closer look at how it really works. Happy lions with nothing to worry about. These big cats at the Finder Game Reserve in South Africa are protected. But conservation initiatives like these cost money and drumming up donations requires a lot of time and effort. Together with two friends and fellow nature lovers, Jason Simth came up with an idea to make donating to animal conservation more attractive with the aid of modern technology. All of us have experienced the bush and uh, love those experiences as, as children. And uh, growing up, we want to preserve that. And we've all been following blockchain blockchain technology for a while and to be able to put that together and merge those two passions was was really special for us. The three friends live in Cape Town and work as software developers. Every transaction in their digital blockchain can be carried out safely and transparently. Most importantly, it is recorded. So what is their idea exactly? For all of our different conservation partners on the Wild Cards platform, these conservations have certain types of animals and species that they look after. And for every animal that they have, we represent that as a unique digital artwork on the blockchain that only one person can have. And if you own this Wild Card, you essentially 
pay a monthly amount to actually support that organization. On the Wildcards digital platform, people can buy and sell rare animal cards using cryptocurrency. For each card, there is a backstory, details of its purchase history, and even a photo of the animal in some cases. And every month, 20% of each card's asking price is donated by its owner to a conservation organization of their choice. One of the first organizations to benefit is the Wild Tomorrow Fund, an American NGO that wants to open up a corridor for wildlife migration in South Africa. The corridor will reconnect animal populations in the Pinda Reserve and the Isamangalisa wetlands. Greg Canning is the general manager of Wild Tomorrow Fund in South Africa. The conservation organization has received more than 45,000 euros in funding through wild cards. The money went toward covering the cost of transforming what was once a pineapple farm into a wilderness area. How it works, uh, I do not know, unfortunately. Um, what I do know is you know, that we are able to fund a lot of our conservation work directly through cryptocurrency um, and, and through organizations such as Wild Cards. Wild Cards make supporting conservation simpler and more direct. Because it takes away a lot of the bureaucracy and purifies it to what people really care about, which is protecting the environment. The wildlife in the Pinda Game Reserve will certainly benefit if more funds are generated. But wildcard founders are also aware of a less attractive aspect of their scheme. It uses a lot of electricity and um, this is concerning and I actually don't believe it's sustainable. Um, but also taking a, a, step, a step back, if we were to use the traditional financial system, we would be paying uh, you know, all of the resources of the bank employees driving to and from work and all the construction of those big buildings. But it's a huge concern and we are going to reduce that as much as we can over time. As, as new technologies come out, we'll move to those technologies that are more efficient. So Wildcards has a dilemma yet to solve. Finding a modern and efficient way to help protect critically endangered animals without adversely contributing to the already critical climate crisis. That looks like an interesting project and certainly makes supporting wildlife fun. But the environmental costs of such digital transactions are still a huge issue. And it's something we would need to keep in mind as cryptocurrencies gain wider acceptance. When you consider that a single Bitcoin transaction has a carbon impact of several hundred kilograms of CO2, it makes you wonder if cryptocurrencies can ever truly be sustainable. And our next report looks into just that. Cryptocurrencies are disrupting the financial world as we know it. And many newcomer investors have made a lot of cash on this hype. But it's not all champagne and super yachts. Mining new cryptocurrency, and particularly Bitcoin, is actually kind of an environmental nightmare, using up huge amounts of electricity and generating thousands of tons of electronic trash in the process. But some new players in the crypto community are trying to change that. In 2021, Bitcoin mining guzzled more electricity than the whole country of Thailand uses each year. And much of that power came from burning cheap fossil fuels, definitely not green or clean. Right now, you would release more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere making one Bitcoin transaction than you would taking a six-hour flight from New York to Amsterdam. That's around two million times more carbon emissions than a single visa payment. Then there's the e-waste. The mining computers burn out or need to be upgraded roughly every 12 to 18 months. There will be a limit to how much um government will accept from this type of system. This is the Dutch economist Alex de Vries. He set up the Bitcoin Energy Consumption Index back in 2014 to track the situation. Now we already saw China banning Bitcoin mining. We're seeing this type of uh, options being raised in Europe at the moment. Everyone's trying to realize their climate ambitions. Of all the digital currencies out there, Bitcoin is by far the worst offender when it comes to the environment. 
The clock seems to be ticking for crypto's most famous poster child to clean up its act. But how could that work? What about using green power sources to mine Bitcoin? Texas is the cheap oil and gas capital of the US, but it also has huge untapped potential for green energy development. There is more wind and solar in Texas than we could ever harvest. Jesse Pelton is the CTO of Hoddle Ranch, a Bitcoin mining company that only uses renewable power. And we see a huge opportunity for Bitcoin mining to be mutually beneficial for the grid. They can act as a buffer in times of power surge and use energy that would otherwise go to waste. But what if international power grids can't or won't incentivize the downtime for the green energy powered miners? They will be inevitably um, losing the competition to the rest of the network and the ones that will survive will be the ones with the most stable power sources and those unfortunately typically happen to be fossil fuel based power sources. As renewable energy becomes cheaper, a hybrid power model is becoming more popular with Bitcoin miners. In 2020, 39% of Bitcoin's global power usage came from renewable sources. If you still want to stick with Bitcoin, but are concerned about the carbon emissions, the underlying blockchain technology can potentially help with that. You can now offset your footprint by purchasing carbon credit tokens that are blockchain verified. The money you invest travels directly via blockchain to fund conservation efforts. A Brazilian environmental tech company called Moss.Earth is becoming a popular option for climate conscious crypto fans. And what we have done um, in order to turn um, crypto investments into, you know, green investment. Luis Ademe is the founder of Moss.Earth. Anyone can buy their verified carbon credits at the click of a button. They're called MCO2 tokens. You can calculate your own pollution from you know, driving cars, using electricity at home, that kind of stuff. And you can buy the equivalent carbon credits. Using blockchain tokens provides a clear record of everyone's green investment transactions. And supposedly the money travels directly to forest conservation projects in the Amazon. The company says the sale of MCO2 tokens has compensated forest projects with over 15 million US dollars and helped preserve around 500 million trees. So there are pioneers trying to clean up crypto's act, but right now they're still few and far between. Bitcoin and digital currencies are here to stay, and if we want to make them sustainable players, investors, companies and governments will have to start changing the rules of the game. From the voucher to the basics, what do we really need to get by? food, water and clothing. We know the fashion industry is not really sustainable and buying second hand helps, but people still like to feel special every now and then. Well, it is possible to pack up your wardrobe without buying new, as we'll see in this week's Doing A Bit. This is Wakalat al -Bala the oldest functioning market in Cairo. Today, it's known for clothing and textiles and is a favorite with thrift shoppers. Artist Enji Abdelhaq started coming here a few months ago. Before that, she'd never considered buying secondhand clothes. But something changed her mind. An artist made me aware that we need to stop over-consuming. We buy without any real need or awareness, and most fabrics these days aren't even natural. Now, when she finds an item she likes, she takes a photo and sends it to Nuran Albanan. Albanan visits Wakalat Albala regularly. It troubles her that clothes are bought and discarded so quickly. Shopping at the market gave her an idea. A lot of used clothing is still in good condition often just a bit dirty or worn. But with a little creativity, items can be transformed into something new and unique. She posted videos of some of her creations online to show what can be done with old clothes. The response surprised her. I made a video of myself painting secondhand clothes and it went down well. 
Once I saw how interested people were and I got more followers, I decided to show more of what I do. That's how it all started. Noran Albanan also began organizing workshops on altering used trousers, jackets and dresses, as well as painting and decorating them to order, to create new, one-of-a-kind pieces, thereby eliminating the need to buy new things. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. At the start of the show, we highlighted what can be done or must be done to preserve wildlife populations here in Africa. But we won't succeed if people and institutions are not aware of how important this work is. You are absolutely right, Sandra. And one way to do that is to engage our children and grandchildren in environmental awareness at an early age. Ghana has already recognized the need for that and made environment an official school subject. Echo Africa took a look at how it has been received. Class is in session at the T.I. Ahmadiyya Senior High School in Kumasi, Ghana's second biggest city. The theme of today's lesson is vital to the future of these students, climate change and how to tackle it. Classes in environmental protection have been taught here for about a year now. Sustainable business ideas are also on the curriculum. The earth has become warm, so it is through human activities that has led to that particular situation. So we have to teach students for them not to continue with what the elderly people have done. That is what we are teaching students now, so that they, they, they deviate from the uh, bad activities that has contributed to the global warming. For most of these students, it's the first time they've heard of the climate crisis, and the subject has really caught their attention. We encourage our parents, our colleagues to um, involve in um, we are for restation, meaning they should rip um, um, plants, trees, so that it will help to reduce um, the global warming effect. I think it would really change our attitude towards the environment. We would all support um, the protection of the environment from now onwards. Teachers are being taught to raise awareness about environmental protection. Over 600 have been trained so far. Over half of Ghana's schools are already integrating the subject into their curriculum, with more to follow. Ghana's education ministry sees environmental education as high priority. It's a way of training the, uh, the, the kids or the learners to own the environment. The environment belongs to them. They are the future leaders. And therefore, we need to inculcate in them a better understanding and appreciation of the task ahead of them. So uh, the curriculum have that aspect in there. The teaching modules focus heavily on the climate crisis. The students learn that the emission of greenhouse gases leads to heat waves and droughts. In addition, sea levels are rising, which is why some villages on the coast will have to be abandoned. Some lessons also deal with the plastic waste that clogs many sewers and drainage canals in Ghana and makes flooding more likely. The students also learn how burning trash impacts the environment and health. Many people in Ghana are already feeling the consequences of environmental destruction firsthand. The climate changes um, in the environment is causing so many problems in our society. You know, there is shortage of food and you know, at times there's flooding and all these things. In order to raise awareness of these problems, more and more schools are also organizing so-called green clubs. Outside of class, the children go on excursions, collect rubbish and plant trees. The green clubs are often led by environmental protection activists. It's much easier to groom the younger ones who will become people who are, who are more responsible instead of possibly focusing on the adults 
we fall the younger ones are the ones now growing up. If we can shape their future in such a way that they are more suited towards building solutions, it is better for the climate and also for their future. Environmental education in schools is a start. The coming years will show whether the seed that was planted here has germinated. So we learned two important things today. We should count our animals in order to conserve them. And with a little creativity, we can make something used into something new. I'm Chris Alems, bidding you farewell from Lagos, Nigeria. Important lessons indeed, Chris. I think initiatives like those we've seen today can really have a big impact. If you want to learn more about environmental protection, follow us on all our social media platforms. I am Sandra Twinovrio, signing off from Kampala here in Uganda. We'll see you again next week.